Now when arrived the 11th of May, as I have heard old Manxman say, each horse was snugly stalled, and cows from off the grassy plain, ere Sol had kissed the western main, were promptly homeward called. Hmm. Few horses and cows round here anymore. Swains and homely glee, fiendish ire. Well, you're hardly Mr. Tennyson, I'm afraid, Mr. William Kennish. <laughs> and though Maytime and Mathold may once have had its charms, not to mention its witches, I'd rather look out of the window to see what May Eve, 1866, in Douglas brings. Light. Flickering out in the heavens. Bonfires. So many bonfires. Who would have thought it after all these years? And it's nearly May already. The months and years crowd in so thick upon one another. No eve, no day. These strange and lovely things are coming from another world to me. Another place. Lights look so pretty flickering out there on the hill. The shape and the shadows of the smoke drifting and rising and falling. If I could see further, perhaps I would see furtive figures up there on the headland, up there on the skyline, leaping over small flames to put an end to the winter. And maybe doing other things it's best not to think of yet. Best <laughs> Them out of sight. <laughs> Goodness, Kate Corrin, what are you thinking of? You are a respectable married woman. There'll be ones making a fuss tomorrow. There always are. There's such a good view from this house. I love the sea from the top of the road. Soon there'll be far more houses pushing up all around us. Tall houses. Nicely appointed, so says Paul. He should know. But will I still see the far hill with the night clouds flocking to rest ragged on the top? Maybe. From up the top of the house, Alice's room perhaps. The whole island is changing. It must. And I suppose <coughs> I must too. Perhaps I should start by not talking to myself. <laughs> my bad habit, so my husband said. But who else is there to talk to? Alice! Alice! Where is the wretched girl? The point of employing servants in this house is beyond me. Yes, I'll be right with you, Mr. Curran. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there you are at last. Look, I told you to shut those windows, all of them, and the upstairs, and keep them shut. Oh, this infernal smoke. What's the matter with everyone? It's not as if we're not sitting up here with that appalling stink from the quayside drifting up 365 days a year. But now the fools are lighting fires just about everywhere. As though it's going to be cold. Cold. Cold and nearly made. Ridiculous. Good evening, husband. Thank you for doing that, Alice. The smoke is disturbing to Mr. Corrin and myself. Yes, it is. And keep the windows shut. That's not a problem, Mrs. Corrin. 
I'm not so fond of the old smook myself. I'll be right off to uh, look at those bedrooms for you. Yes, thank you, Alice. Where are they, Kate? They're not where I left them. What is it you've lost, Paul? The plans for the new terrace, of course. I was only explaining them to you yesterday. And they're not lost. Somebody has removed them. It will either be you or Alice. I hardly think Mrs. Cray would ever venture forth from her kitchen. Yes, I remember. I'm sorry, Paul. Perhaps I moved them to the bureau for safety. Alice is going to dust. These are they, are they not? Yes, they are. And please leave my work alone in future. If I'd wanted you to take on the role of assistant maid servant in this house, I'd have employed you as such. But you are not. You are my wife. And I need you to, well, think a little more. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, I'm being hard. But this is our future, you understand? Our future, our prosperity. Indulge me. Look. Here's where the so-called boarding school for young ladies is, here on the corner. And that will have to go in poor repair. But this land behind is what I had my sights on. I think we can safely say that Robertson will sell if the price is right. But there will be some work to persuade them. Excuse me, ma'am, but will I be shown the visitors in now? Visitors? At this hour? Are we expecting anyone? Ah, oh, yes, of course, I remember. Um, yes, make haste, fellas, show them in. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, the smoke seems to seek you out. I have quite the cough now. <coughs> Go on, girl, bring them in. <coughs> Who is to disturb our peace this evening, Kate? Remind me. It's a Mr. and Mrs. Ella Stevenson, Paul. The husband is a distant business acquaintance of yours, I believe. The visit is apparently urgent, hence the late hour. Stevenson? Let me think. Ah, uh, yes, the timber merchant. Odd chap. Said to have an unusually forthright wife. He has his sights set on a nice little plot up Glen Crutchery way. A pleasant development. Contact, Kate. We will cultivate them. We must be particularly charming, my dear. Of course. Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Ellison. Oh, Ellis Stevenson. Ellis Stevenson. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Stevenson, please do come in. Pardon me, ma'am. I seem to have got your name muddled. Don't concern yourself, young woman. You wouldn't be at first. <laughs> yes, do come in. And please accept my sincere apologies for the tardiness of our maid. She's from the country, you know. A soldier way. Yeah. <laughs> Quite so, yes. Soldier. Very distant. Um, Ellis Stevenson. And Mrs. Ellis Stevenson, as I believe we've now established. How do you do? Pleased to make your acquaintance. And we're pleased to meet you both. Delighted, I'm sure, on all accounts. Now, let's not beat about the bush. We come here on a mission. Isn't that right, Mr. Stevenson? Yes, I, I believe so. Is that right? Well, we are intrigued. Please, you must sit down and take tea with us. Oh, or perhaps something stronger. I will not take tea. An addictive substance. I prefer to keep myself clear and focused. As does Mr. Stevenson, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, thank you, old chap. Yes, of course. What do you mean? <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, weather seems to have taken a turn for the worse. Well, <coughs> you know as well as I do that this is not weather. This is smoke. This is burning. I see. This is devilry, <coughs> which is precisely my point. Go slow, dear. I will not be silenced, Mr. Stevenson. The matter before us is an urgent one, as Mr. Corrin has just reminded us. I trust you are recovered. <clears throat> yes, I'm fine, thank you. Good show, <clears throat> good show. Never go anywhere without a pocket handkerchief, that's what I say. Mrs. Curry, my dear, I don't believe we've met, but I have been informed of your most excellent demeanour and charity towards the less fortunate and foolish of our society. Thank you, you are too generous. Oh, not at all. And you, Mr. Corrin, are most well regarded. 
an up-and-coming citizen of our little town. A man of vision, I am told. <laughs> you flatter me. But yes, I have my connections. Yes, I, I do have, well, visions for this town, if you like. A new town for new times. Then we have common interests, Mr. Corrin. You may not be aware, but I am a writer of some influence. Really? Oh, Mrs. Stevenson, if I might ask, what do you write? Perhaps some poetry? Poetry is lies! I write the truth of what I see. So naturally, as a member of the weaker sex, I must hide myself behind a non de plume. Fascinating. Do tell. Mm, she will. <laughs> <laughs> to you alone, I will reveal that I am none other than very concerned of Upper Douglas. <laughs> that most regular correspondent to the Mona's Herald. Ah, I see I have you there. Ah, oh, yes, the radical rag. Yes, I must admit you do have me there. We uh, progressors must remain incognito, eh? Oh, I have read your most regular correspondence with an eagle eye. Though I had no idea that your wife, Mr. Stevenson, was the power behind that particular pen. Oh, oh she certainly had a way with words, eh? <laughs> and Mr. Corrin, I believe you to be the very gentleman writing under the name An Observer, am I correct? Yes, you are. You found me out. The Times and the Herald, uh, foot in both camps. Might I say, I found your proposals to move the outdoor markets indoors most intriguing. <laughs> Thank you. I wish more thought so. The people of this town are incredibly reluctant to modernise. I mean, a perfectly good hall, purpose built. Boy, I had a hand in the design myself. But no, there they all are, out in all weathers, filth, dirt. One might almost think they like it there. Quite. <laughs> Meanwhile, disease is rife, alcohol fuels fits, and children run around wild and ignorant of the Lord. You yourself, as a gentleman of the building profession, can hardly remain indifferent to the living conditions of the feckless and profane, living not two streets from this very house. I've seen such vice in America, and now I see it here. So, uh, how might my dear wife and I be of assistance, Mrs. Stevenson? In a word, we fight. Myself and a few of the more concerned citizens, fearful for the morality of this town, are readying for battle. <laughs> oh dear. Battle? <laughs> <laughs> desperate times, Mr. Corrin, desperate times. Why, tonight, this very night, young men and women of the lower sort are taking to the hills, unchaperoned, for the so-called burning out of witches. Some sort of mass license for misbehaviour. It is wrong-headed, morally dangerous, and contrary to scripture. A superstitious rite, redolent of the dark and diabolical worship of the Druids. We claim to be a God-fearing nation, Mr. Corrin. This must be stopped. I share your concerns. Uh, such behaviours hardly attract a better class of person to come and live amongst us. But I must confess I'm at a loss as to how one might proceed. Really, I, I think such things are best left to those of the clerical persuasion. Oh, do excuse me, boy. Bill sticks. There are many who are too fearful to fight this battle, but I am not. True leadership is what is required. And if man is not to be trusted, it is to the women we must look. What say you, Mrs. Corrin? Well, certainly there are So, are we mere gentlemen to be excused, then? I'll leave you ladies to your most pressing debate. Quite so, quite Mr. So. Stevenson and I may have one or two practical business concerns. Leave the ladies to your interest. <laughs> Sit down, Alice, do! Paul, I really do think you should stay if Mrs. Stevenson has such an important message to convey. Important? Certainly. Mr. Collin. Have you ever considered how few of the lower classes can actually read your worthy disputations in the local newspaper? Neither can they read my poor efforts. But they have ears, and may be roused to rationality and true religion yet. Education is all. But who is to be the educator? That is the thing. Mr. Stevens.
Stevenson, is that not the thing? The thing? Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. Me and my committee have set a meeting for the reformation of the moral character of the Manx peasantry and the abolition of superstitious practices. What do you think of the title, Mrs. Torrin? Really covers the issues in a nutshell, I think. <laughs> I think people will understand to what you refer. R.S. Putin. A.S. Putin. Yes, so, when do we look forward to this meeting? A public one, I presume. The inaugural meeting will be a week on Tuesday at the Wellington Hall. Room for several hundred standing. I myself will be addressing it, naturally. But I look for your support, Mr. Torrin. You have a Manx name. You may have some influence among your workforce, connections. And of course, as the matter of financing the campaign, I trust you'll be more than happy to help us along in that direction. And you, Mrs. Torrin, I do hope you'll consider joining us. I will consider what you say, and thank you, Alistair Showyard. Thank you. I'll leave you some information, and me and my committee look forward to hearing from you soon. The information, please, Mr. Stevenson. Ah, yes, the briefcase. Yes, yes. Here we have it. Pleasant evening to you. Read and take note. Thank you. And I bid you both good night. <laughs> Pleasant evening. Tender old chap, Joe. She's after money, of course. Why can't old Stevenson keep her quiet? No backbone. She certainly is a most unusual lady to be addressing company like that. Brave, I suppose, although no care for how she may be regarded. Mm. You would never do that, would you, Kate? Stand up and say what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness. You see, the way you are, Kate, as my wife, I mean, what you are. It governs how I'm perceived by society. Uh, how we are perceived. Families, reputation, they matter, Kate. You could have married better, Kate. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but damn it, Kate, it was you I wanted. I mean, your family is well regarded here. Not wealthy, admittedly, but of long standing, respected. As you know, my own father made a good name for himself in Liverpool over the years. I always intended to follow in his footsteps, but back here, on his native soil, with, with you by my side. Rational, reasonable, forward-looking. All I ask is that you follow those same paths with me, Kate. I'm not always convinced we share that particular vision. I have never opposed you in what you do. And I would never make a show of you, Paul. You know that. No. You are loyal and... I'm irritable this evening. Ignore me. Let's see what our writer of some influence has to say. <laughs> Fires of Baal. What the heck? Where do these people come from? Do you know, Kate, it's hard to imagine that idiot Stevenson is running a successful import business. But he is. Useful contact to the bank, obviously. That's what our wife is. Complete harry, and worse, a religious enthusiast. Oh, when these people get God, they've always got to shout about it. <laughs> Leave muscular Christianity to those of us who muscle, I say. Still, we may consider a donation. Depends who else is backing her. If I do support them, I trust that fool Stevenson will remember me for it. I trust he will. Now, I must resume the embroidery and consider how to make a prior engagement a week on Tuesday. Yes, you do that, Kate. Clever girl. <laughs> What's this? Crosses tied to the tails of cows. <laughs> ridiculous. It is ridiculous, Kate. Tell me you think it's ridiculous, please. Well, maybe, but surely harmless enough. For you, maybe. I dare say... You know more about these things haven't been brought up on this island. <clears throat> Maybe, I won't ask, you once indulged in a little bit of this primrose magic yourself. But you do not understand the modern world, Kate. You read too much poetry. You must ensure it does not cloud your judgment. Primrose magic. That's 
sounds lovely, Paul. <laughs> yes, yellow flowers to keep away the fairies. We all thought that would help. Your family too, I expect, before they left for England. Yes, harmless enough. Well, don't get any ideas. I do not want rotting weeds strewn on our doorstep, nor bitter branch up there gathering cobwebs. And tell Alice, in case she imagines I've gone blind in my old age, no primroses, no mess, no criss, cross. Cross terms? <laughs> yes, those. This is a ridiculous conversation. I have a letter to write to the bank. We will talk later. Ladies and gentlemen, and all good thinking people of Douglas, I thank you for your appearance at this meeting here tonight. I will not sit down. The gentlemen will have their turn, as I was saying. Thank you for your attendance here tonight. It is so gratifying to see so many. Perhaps there might be some more space down the back. Down the business. Why are we here tonight? Well, the presence of so many respectable gentlemen of the cloth on the platform here behind me, as well as so many members of our enlightened business community, will give you some indication of the importance of tonight's meeting, the purpose of which is, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of which is, ladies and gentlemen, for the launch of a new movement the reformation of the moral character of the Manx peasantry and the abolition of the superstitious practices or the RMC and PASP in short. <laughs> Consider, we live in times of great uncertainty, change. We must hold fast to all that we know is good. But not all that we know is good. Not all that we know comes from God. We are all too aware that on this island, paganism is rife. That same unlettered countryman that bows his head before the Lord on Sunday will cower before the evil eye on Monday. You all know of what I speak. Not two weeks previously, on the very eve of May, we all witnessed the spectacle of the hills near our very homes rising up in flames high enough to threaten the very heavens themselves. Our ears were sorely pained by the devilish cries of primitive instruments, horns, drums, a very cacophony. Are these the actions of a civilized race? I say they are not. I have worse news for you, ladies and gentlemen. Barely credible, I concede in this day and age. But we have received reports from the heart of distant Andreas, <laughs> of individuals engaged in horrible animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice? To what? To whom? Are we the savages of Borneo? No. I no. say we are not. And the time has come to take our place as good responsible Christian citizens on this small outpost of the British Empire. Join us, and by the sweat of our brows, we will wipe superstition from the land. Let the battle commence. God save the Queen! God save the Queen!
there anything else you require me to do, Mrs. Collins? No, I don't think so. Thank you, Alice. Mr. Corrin is attending his campaign meeting tonight. He may be late. Sit down, Alice. Take a rest. You must be worn out. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. You never stop. You must be worn out. Well, a great house like this doesn't clean itself, ma'am. Mr. Corrin is always very particular. He is indeed. Mr. Corrin likes to keep a well-run house. It could not be done without you, Alice, and Mrs. Crane, of course. Thank you, ma'am. I hope the work is to the satisfaction of the both of you. Yes, very much. Thank you. But, well, life cannot, should not be all work. True, but perhaps I shouldn't say. Many of us have no choice, ma'am. Of course. I like your honesty, Alice. Although I should really inform you that Mr. Corrin does sometimes find it a trifle impertinent. I told him it's because you're young, but you really ought to make care with maintaining the boundaries. Boundaries, is it? Well, I'm sorry to be impertinent. No offence to yourself or Mr. Corrin intended. Perhaps I should return to the kitchen now. Oh, no. Please don't do that. I'd rather you stay here. The house is quiet without my husband, and Mrs. Crane has gone home. As you wish, ma'am. Do you read, Alice? No, ma'am. Well, not much. Can you read? <coughs> what I need to, ma'am. Oh. Can be very freeing, you know, reading. I dare say. It helps you think of things, get ideas, plans, imagine things, maybe even find out who you really are. I know exactly who I am. Alice Corlett, 20 years of age, native of the village of Sulby, maid servant. That's all. You're more than that, surely. You must have ideas and dreams and plans. Even when you're at work, your mind can be somewhere else, surely. For example, I don't know, when scribbling the scullery or, well, what do you think of when you carry the coal upstairs? Well, if you want the truth, ma'am, I'm thinking I'd rather not be carrying it up at all. <laughs> it's awful heavy and it's a great big lump of a bucket and there's a hole on the way and the coal dust gets just about everywhere. And I am not thankful for that great big cuss of a fellow who invented the staircase. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was foolish of me to say. Perhaps one day... And where I come from, there's not many staircases at all. And not much in the way of rooms either. I'm sure this house would have seemed very different to you in the first place. It was. I was looking for all the people that might be living here. And all I found was the two of you. Our Mary's one is nine to two rooms in Barrett Street. Well, then I'm really glad you are here, Alice. Honestly, I am. If I might be so bold and not myself impertinent, might I ask, are you still walking out with that young man, Alfie? Or hey, you... I am not, Mrs. Corrin. True, we were going strong, but he could not say hey no haw for himself. So I'm set on something better. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be, Mrs. Corrin. He wasn't up to much. <laughs> Awful lumpy. And a significant mother at him. <laughs> Besides, I'm seeing someone different on Sunday. Oh, quick work. I hope that works out for you, Alice. A nice husband in time, maybe? Oh, no. Fred and you, ma'am. Yes. Time enough. Indeed. A chance to start again, now summer's here. Oh, I wonder, did you hear the news? One of those fires a week or two ago on May Eve got out of hand. Up at Callow's place. The papers are full of it. Yes. I heard there was a bit of a muster up there. They were saying the owl fella got his breeches near burnt off him <laughs> and his backside hanging out. And he was coughing and cursing fit to wake the dead. And it was him who started the fire anyway. 
<laughs> I doubt those particular newspaper details made it into the newspaper somehow. People like to exaggerate. I wonder what it's all about, though, really. All this burning. I don't know at all. Clearing the ground, starting again. Pardon me, ma'am, but I'm thinking. With all this burning and firing and all, people need to clean and clear the place out from time to time. Like me and me spring cleaning, <laughs> or Mr. Corrin and his grand new developments. They all start with clearing the land till the next time. I suppose there's not much difference. That's very profound of you, Alice. Although I hope Mr. Corrin's legacy lasts a long time yet. As I see it, there's summer and there's winter. And well, they just keep coming back, the same old pattern. And you can't have one without the other. Probably not. You're too young to remember this, but I would remember when I was very small, seeing the fight between summer and winter. Although it wasn't really a fight, it was a sort of procession. My mother said it was a grand big thing down in Castletown, maiden. Even the quality was in. Oh, and there was a big fella, the Al Deemster, and he was doffing his hat at the Queen terrible serious. More made of him being Queen herself. I remember when I was very small, I always wanted to be part of the mace board. I always hoped I'd be picked to be one of the little girls dressed up with fancy flowers following the Queen of May. I always hoped I'd get a pretty ribbon as such. But no. And I remember there on the other side was old winter, all drab as you like. Summer won the battle, of course. And so she should, till winter comes grabbing at her toes, tripping her up. And whose side would you be on, Alice? Winter or summer? Summer, of course, with all them pretty dresses at her most like. Winter's not all bad, though. Stories round the fire. The look of a clear, a clear day with the hills just after snow. The rumble in your stomach when there's not much to fill it. True. I do remember those days, Alice. A little. From earlier. Things have turned out very differently for us. Chance, I suppose. But there are things from the old life that I miss. The way of talking easy, perhaps. It's difficult talking easy, ma'am, between ourselves. Inappropriate, most would say. Mr. Corrin would certainly say so. Well, he's not here tonight, is he? <laughs> no, he's out, fighting for our future. I feel left behind sometimes, Alice. You know, it can be lonely in my position too. Time goes on, nothing much changes for me. Nothing changes? How can you be saying that, living in this lovely big house and all time for doing, well, whatever you fancy? Oh, pardon me, ma'am. That's unfair, Alice. I'm sorry, ma'am, ma'am, I spoke out of turn. Yes, you did. Even so, what I meant to say was, well, when I married, I became someone else. And that was it. Need it be like that, though? I wouldn't know, of course, but that Mrs. Stevenson woman, I'm sure she didn't change one little bit when she got married, unfortunately. Her husband might have, though. But in a way, I admire her. She has spirit. She doesn't let things rest. Aye, she's got go, all right. There's ones in like that. And then there's ones who are just sitting where the good Lord put them, not shifting, like me grandmother. Nothing changes for that one. Well, not in her head, though her legs aren't as big as they were. Never been out of Solby, and not for starting now. There are a few like that still. She'd be saying, what are people doing, going, changing things for? 
Tonight is the real May Eve, she's telling me. She's not one for people changing the calendar, telling you what to do and when to do it. Same as the Christmas. She'll be seeing that in January till her dying day. Goodness, so tonight is the real May Eve. Well, that's what my grandmother is saying. She'd be out up on them mountains herself if she wasn't so gone in the age, looking for divilment most like. But she'd take care that she wasn't took for some witch herself, though. Indeed she would. So, if she's right about dates, then tonight, the 11th of May, is the true May Eve. So, tomorrow is the true May Day. Well, then we are surely still in some sort of in-between time that's neither one thing or the other. Strange, dangerous, it's almost like you're crossing the river between two parishes and don't yet know which side you're on. I suppose so, especially if you fall in. <laughs> of course, I'm not really talking about the river, but rather the space between the two, like the banks, the space between the two. Pardon me, ma'am, but I'm not really understanding what you're saying. Poor... Mr. Corrin says that to me often. But just think, Alice, if there were a time where one may say what one likes, do what one likes, even be what one likes, surely you would embrace it? You could be free to choose. You could be summer or winter. Old or young? God or the devil? Servant or missus? A man or a woman? man. I wonder what it's like to be someone else. Ma'am? I am winter's champion. I challenge you to a fight. Do you accept? I do. <laughs> but I don't think Mr. Curran's going to be too keen of me using his stick. Choose your weapon, Alice. You're young and summer's champion. On guard. Ma'am? Take that, madame. I will not, sir, then do your worst. I will. Halt. This will not do. The sides are too well matched. Here, give me a stick. I declare a tug of war instead. Pull, pull. There we are, perfectly matched, as strong as one another. I am winter. I will not let you in. I, you must. I am summer. Let the summer in! Oh! 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 She banny me! There's an awful Gerud in here! Oh, me, me mother would say, it's making a show of ourselves. Mine too, I do not know what came over me. Alas! Oh, oh. Here, let me put that hat back. There's no deal done on that there. It's, it's all right, ma'am. Just Emma Jack, English lit. Did you ever really get to wear a pretty dress and go round with the lace ball? Is that what you're calling it? Heavens, no. I was too young. I was just watching, just once. My mother held me up on her shoulders. I was just so happy. It didn't feel wicked at all. It was just like a play, it was. A true play. Hey. Hey, dear, in here. Where's Alice? I'll be away off now, Mrs. Curran. Thank you for our uh, play. I'll not say anything. You can trust me on that one. Till next year, then, on the in-between times. Oh, that Stevenson woman is insufferable. But annoying as she's writing away. 
If you'd only directed jabbering energies to the real issue of this town, they would be up there with Ipswich or somewhere. <laughs> oh, there's the hat I was looking for. I picked the other one. Good. I'm glad. But was Mrs. Stevenson the only speaker? <laughs> Certainly not. They're probably the loudest. Actually, there were some quite sensible chaps there, too. Took the liberal religion out of it. Old Stevenson, too. I mean, he can speak, by the way. We were talking afterwards. We must build, you know, okay? A model of urban development we'd be. No more stinking slums. No more grasping natives. Fewer lawyers, less crime. And proper English, too. You'd hear that spoken. You know, Kate, outside this town, a third of the population, one third cannot speak English properly. Well, of course, you know. You could probably jabber along with the rest of them with their butcherings and balding. I have had it up to here with fairies and witches this evening. As for sacrifices, biblical or otherwise, I've had my fill. No. I live in the real world. No more public meetings for me. I went. She has a donation. I consider my civic duty done. You certainly had a long evening. You look tired, dear. Did she make you stand on stage? <laughs> no. My piety is obviously suspect. <laughs> we did have the Reverend so-and-so and Minister such and such with their platitudes and warnings. We were all going up in the next big flame, apparently. Unless we repent. I suspect we'll all go up in flames next May Eve anyway, unless the fire service improves. Surely not. Oh, yes. We're all for it, according to our dissenting brethren. They are much the worst. The Methodists? Oh, yes, absolutely the worst sort. <laughs> you laughing at me, Kate. I'll never know whether you are or not. <laughs> laughing at you? Of course not. There are no dissenters lurking behind the curtain, see? And no witches last time I checked as well. You see, our fire has died down nice and fast. You had a busy evening. Are you not going to ask me about mine? Why? You're reading, surely, as usual. Anything untoward in the annals of Fairyland? No. Just a short conversation with Alex. Yes, well, I have these figures to reconcile before I go to bed. I shall probably be up half the night, so don't wait up. Somebody has to bring the money and think straight. <coughs> Sorry, this cough is still troublesome. <coughs> and perhaps a whiskey might do the trick. Very well. Good night, dear. Good night, Kate. It's been more than a year now, almost two. It's a pity he's not here to walk up the road and see how his square is developing, how his dream of Sir Douglas is slowly coming to pass. Pavings, railings, 
neat little gardens, so there's not much growing in them yet. He saw the way that the world was changing and had the sense to change with it, too, I suppose. Not that it did him good. Well, he's gone. And I'm still left with these wretched books and ledgers. No more poetry books for me. My financial situation is apparently somewhat precarious. I'll have to let Alice go. There's a position at the Cowley household, I believe. Oh, I'll miss her. Excuse me a minute. You're still here. I thought you'd be away from the hills with the young people. Leaping over small fires cutting into the winter, sounding the horns. Come and look at the flames. Not me now, Mrs. Pollard. Yes, they are beautiful. But I'm thinking of all them little creatures that are homeless, or maybe worse. Oh, Alice, I hope you don't think... Oh, no, no, Mrs. Corrie. I didn't mean that at all. It can't be helped. And you've been so kind to me. I'm, I'm glad you're trying to find me a new position. But how will you manage? I'll manage somehow, Alice, thank you. The house will be sold, of course. I wondered, would it? I, I had a moment to myself when I was walking to the baker's and I passed a lovely patch of primroses. So I picked them and brought them back here. Thought they'd look well in a jug. Put them over on the table there, as it being nearly May and all. I, I hope you don't mind. Oh, of course not. Thank you, Alice. Every house should have primroses and lots of flowers, spring flowers, summer flowers. And yes, I think we ought to get some crushed kern about the place as well. I do not feel right without knowing it's here somehow. Is it too late, do you think? Ah, oh, no, it's never too late. Here, have a look in my basket. I've got some kern, and I've got some wool from Kayleigh's field. Here, you know what you're doing. I can help you. Yes, I do know what to do. I'm a balaf girl, although I'm a long time out of practice. <laughs> if that Ellison woman could see us now. Stevenson. Oh, that one. It's good she can't. She doesn't know the half of it. Bit clicky if you ask me. Always was. Always will be. No wonder her husband turned to the drink. Well, that's what the sweet's saying. A poor woman. Bold, though. Perhaps the world is changing. It is that. It may be different to what you, me, or anyone else at all is thinking. Here, help me with this. Do you remember the time we were talking about the Queen of the May? And you were saying how you'd sat on your mother's shoulders and watched the procession going by and wanted to be part of it? I do remember. I can't imagine being that young now. Perhaps, Alice, one day you'll have your own little girl to bring into the world. You could show her wonders. We were never so fortunate as to have children ourselves. I'm sorry about that, Mrs. Corrie. And I'm sorry about Mr. Corrie, too. I hope I do have children, God willing. But I'm waiting first on a decent offer. <laughs> so I've got somebody in mind. Ooh. Tall, dark and handsome? No. Short, stout and a great big boil at the end of his nose. He <laughs> has me not. <laughs> kind? Yes. And no trouble at all. Quite in his ways. Our Dan is just too be fine. Oh, but Mrs. Curry. You're so young, you're still young, you've still got time. Look, it's me. Get the look in, start again. 
They'll be queuing up on the doors before the year is out. <laughs> Alice, I hardly think so. Really, the thought. The Reverend Cowley and his very wise sayings. Mr Horton and his very loud voice. Dad and his droopy to moustache, the bear symbol laugh. <laughs> Here, are you done? I'll go and fix it upon the door. Well, it might not bring the good fellows in, but it should keep the bad ones out. Ah, that's themselves you're talking about. But mortal men, that's a different matter. But there is a way of finding out, if you really want to know who's for you. And you'll tell me, no doubt. But if it involves snails or salt cellars, then I shall leave you to it. But don't stay up too late, Alice. No doubt you'll be wanting to rise early to wash your face in the morning dew. There's wonders for the complexion, I believe. Indeed, there's nothing wrong with my face that soap and water won't cure. <laughs> nothing wrong at all. <clears throat> good night, Alice. I'll leave you good night. All will be well now. I'm sure of that. All will be well. little lights are dying down on the hill. The sun is going to come up and the smoke will drift off the sea. The winter is nearly past and with it its cruelties, its cold, burnt away into a stubble. Its secrets too are lost and the strange impulses of the heart. To what will we awake? The flowers spring up where waiting ground lies empty. They will. They must. 